All right, now, maybe you just heard the Zoom uh, person saying that the webinar is being recorded. Um, we know that you probably have colleagues and friends who are not able to make the webinar today. That is perfectly fine because by the end of the week, we will have the recording of this webinar up on our VA section webinar page. Uh, thanks to Dr. Suzanne Spinola, our fabulous VA section webinar coordinator, along with the slides. And so um, you people who are here today will be able to receive continuing education credits, but folks will be able to view the webinar at their leisure and um, but will not be able to get uh, continuing education credits. Um, I am thrilled today to introduce our presentation for the month of May. As you can see from the screen, uh, our webinar title today is Building Spiritual Strength and Evidence-Based Group Intervention for Moral Injury. Before I introduce our amazing speaker, a couple of things. One, back to our discussion about continuing education. According to APA guidelines, you must attend this webinar for at least 45 minutes in order to be eligible for your CEU credit. And so when you complete the survey, which I'll post in the chat at the end of the webinar, uh, we will have to double check our Zoom records to make sure that you were in attendance for at least 45 minutes. Um, also, just want to let you know, Dr. Harris will be happy to entertain questions during the presentation. I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom task bar. There is a Q&A uh, box and there's also a chat box. So if you just want to post a comment, please feel free to do so in the chat. But if you have a question for Dr. Harris as she's moving along, please post that in the chat. I mean, I'm sorry, post that in the Q&A box. And then um, when the time seems appropriate, I will sort of, uh, you know, knock, knock, knock and um, interrupt Dr. Harris, or, you know, maybe when she's taking a breath and uh, I will ask her uh, the question. So we do want to invite you to go ahead and participate by asking questions in the Q&A box uh, during the presentation. So let's get on with it. Let me introduce to you Dr. J. Irene Harris. She is a psychologist and senior clinician investigator with the VA Maine Healthcare System and is also an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School. She served as a clinician, administrator, and investigator in the VA system since 2002. Uh, she does research in spirituality and mental health for the past 30 years with a focus on spiritually integrated care for moral injury, addiction, and PTSD. Dr. Harris also provides national leadership through positions on APA's task force on serious mental illness and serious emotional disorders, the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention's Recovery Transformation Workgroup, and Chair of VA's Mental Health Lived Experience Community of Practice. Without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Irene Harris. Thanks, Irene. Okay. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you very much for your interest in moral injury and how we can help our veterans with this. Um, so very quickly, building spiritual strength is one of five evidence-based treatments available for moral injury syndrome. Uh, building spiritual strength is the only one that is the only evidence-based approach that is a group modality. And it is the only one that has a randomized control trial documenting that the intervention can be correctly implemented by chaplains. So there are more choices about ways to use the intervention using building spiritual strength. It is eight sessions long. I usually recommend no more than six veterans in a group. Um, 
So you actually have already heard all of these things about me. I don't need to spend a bunch of time talking to myself. I do have to say that I'm a VA employee. I'm on VA time. If I say something stupid, I am not speaking on behalf of the VA. If I'm stupid, I'm stupid just for myself. And I'm going to start with a case study. Um, of course, we have a number of identifying characteristics for this case changed to protect the privacy of this veteran. But Robert what came to me in our very first study of building spiritual strength back when the intervention was experimental. It is no longer considered experimental. Um, at the time he came to me, he had been deployed 13 times over 10 years in very short but extremely violent special forces deployment. He had developed a serious case of PTSD, so serious that it eventually cost him his position in the military. At the time Robert came to me, he had completed prolonged exposure and he had good results. He had really put most of his symptoms of PTSD in remission. However, he was still having some very serious symptoms of moral injury syndrome. I, when I spoke with Robert initially, one of the things that I assessed was a suicide risk. It was an experimental intervention. We don't put acutely suicidal veterans in experimental interventions. We put them in interventions that we know will help them. Robert told me, oh yeah, I have a thought about suicide once in a while, but I have kids. I would never act on that thought. Three years later, I was presenting at a community conference and one of the other presenters was Robert's spouse. In her presentation, she shared that at the time Robert started building spiritual strength, every day she was picking up the children at school, driving the car into the garage, telling the children, I want you to stay here for a minute. I'll come back and get you. Going into the house to make sure that daddy wasn't dead and only then coming back to get the children. He had seriously underrepresented the amount and severity and intensity of his suicide ideation because he knew that I wouldn't put him in the study if he said that he was at high risk. When he came to me, his predominant symptom of moral injury, and we'll talk a little bit about the different ways that moral injury can present, but his predominant symptom was a loss of purpose. He felt that his military position was a mission given to him by God and that he had failed at this mission and no longer was in God's good graces. Another source of spiritual distress for him was that he had an ex-wife and he felt that he was in an unforgiving and unforgiven relationship with him. As he talked with me, two words came up very frequently. The first was unforgiven and the other one unforgivable and the other one was unredeemable. So he had this very deep existential worth crisis going on. Things changed rapidly for Robert in the course of the Building Spiritual Strength intervention. Sessions two and three in Building Spiritual Strength are what I jokingly refer to as marriage counseling and the relationship with a higher power or an ultimate value. Robert referred to his higher power as God. He identified as an evangelical Christian. Before he started building spiritual strength, he thought of God as a drill sergeant that gives him missions and he needs to complete those missions to stay in the good graces of God. After that session, he had this new concept of God as essentially a loving parent who was excited about who Robert was simply because God had created Robert and God was watching to see what Robert would choose to do with the resources and training and talents that he had been given. Um, Robert reported to me that his suicidal ideation stopped on that day. Sessions six and seven are on forgiveness. And during session six, Robert learned more about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is giving up the opportunity to exact revenge and wanting the best for someone, even if they have wronged you. He began to realize in his relationship with his ex-wife, he was 
paying for her housing. He was doing a great deal to make her life easier in part because they had shared children and he wanted them in good housing and good living conditions. He also had gone way out of his way to try to help connect her with treatment for her addiction, which is what had disrupted their relationship. She was not interested in that help. So he began to realize he in fact had forgiven and he was continuing to behave in a forgiving fashion. What had not happened was reconciliation, which requires two people and she was not able to do a part of a reconciliation process. So Robert was able to stop thinking of himself as unforgiving. He was able to find new ways to set boundaries in that relationship. And he was able to stop beating himself up for being an unforgiving person, which was not an accurate self-perception. Robert is now working as a licensed mental health provider. He has a private practice in an urban area that focuses primarily on veterans who are managing PTSD and moral injury. As you might imagine, many veterans like the idea of seeing a provider who is a veteran who has learned how to manage PTSD and moral injury themselves. And I think his practice will be thriving for a very long time. The target conditions for building spiritual strength are post-traumatic stress disorder, and what most people call moral injury, I prefer to call it spiritual distress. And I will explain more about that later. Since we have an audience primarily of VA psychologists, I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. I am imagining most of you have gotten more training with post-traumatic stress disorder than you may have ever wanted and are likely working with it every day. So I will skip through this unless somebody puts in the chat that um, you really want me to go back over some of that, in which case I will come back and do it. Moral injury is a different story, however. Um, there are 12 different accepted definitions of moral injury in the literature. So just so we're in on the same page, the one I am using are the psychological and behavioral sequelae of experiences that challenge deeply held moral, spiritual, or values-related beliefs. Now, when I am talking with other professionals, I almost always use the word moral, in, the term moral injury. It is now very deeply accepted in our research structure. Most people seem to have a general sense of what you're talking about. We have instruments designed specifically to measure moral injury, et cetera. In my work with veterans, and I've seen or supervised at least 300 cases of treatment for moral injury, more and more I am hearing from veterans that while some like the term moral injury, they feel that it gives language to an experience that they have had, that they have not had language for. I hear many veterans react negatively to that term, especially the term moral. Many veterans hear that term as an inherent judgment that they have done something that is immoral. And therefore, are, they're hearing their clinicians make a judgment about them in simply using that term. Unless a veteran comes to me using that term, I don't introduce that term. I generally take the narrative approach of asking the veteran what he or she would like to call the concern that they are bringing to me. And if they struggle with finding language for it, I will offer for those who identify as spiritual, the term spiritual distress. For those who don't identify as spiritual, I often use the term values related distress. Um, most veterans seem to experience those terms as less judgmental and I feel like they're just a better place to start a therapeutic process. How do you know you're sitting in a room with somebody who's managing moral injury. Some of the hallmarks might be that they have lost or struggled with previously held spiritual beliefs, or they've got some sort of major conflict in relationship with a higher power. Many people will tell me that God died on the battlefield or that God has abandoned them, 
or while they would like to have a concept of God, what they think of as God can't possibly exist given what they have experienced. Often you will see people who before combat or another potentially morally injurious experience, experience themselves as deeply forgiving and patient with others. And now they find that they are not forgiving at all. And they're in fact irritable and get frustrated with people or even angry with people in such a way that it damages relationships over the least little thing. Robert's presentation was characterized by that loss of meaning or purpose in life. Jeremy Jenkerson is an Air Force psychologist who very aptly describes moral injury as a disorder of trust. Individuals either lose trust that they themselves will act in a moral, responsible manner toward others, or they lose trust that others will act in a moral, responsible manner toward them. Either way, relationships get disrupted. They get a little differently disrupted from the internalized loss of trust than the externalized loss of trust. And then for those who lose trust in themselves, there is typically inappropriate guilt and shame. For those who lose trust in others, there is typically inappropriate and persistent anger. What does this look like in your office? What I hear from my veterans who are seeing me for help with moral injury is often they are put in a situation of having to provide sexual favors or something else inappropriate and ethical to get resources that they need to protect either their own safety or the safety for others in their units. Um, in our modern warfare, inflicting moral injury is becoming a well-developed weapon. Insurgents, for example, I think I hear about this every day, insurgents will throw infants, small children, disabled people or elderly people in front of a convoy to stop the convoy. The only reason one would do that would be to attack the convoy. So the convoy driver has the point, the choice between hitting the person who's thrown in front of the convoy or potentially having 100 people in their convoy attacked, killed, injured, etc. From those who are in enlisted ranks, I often hear that command could have prevented a situation from becoming dangerous and they failed to do so. From those in command, I hear the other side of that same coin, that they have no choice but to enter a battle, to assign positions for that battle, full well knowing that whoever they signed to specific positions was going to die. And then from military medical personnel, I often hear them being overwhelmed and helpless to prevent or manage harm. For example, if there's one medic in the unit and then after a particularly bad battle, there's a mass casualty situation with 30 people down, each of whom could be saved if we had five medics, but we have one medic. So these are different, what we call potentially morally injurious events that put people in a severe moral dilemma that can lead to moral injury syndrome. Why would we need to treat moral injury? Well, the most important reason is that more and more research is now being published demonstrating that those who are managing moral injury syndrome are at very much increased risk for suicide ideation and suicide attempts. Um, so very, very recently researched, but recently published research by Sharon McGuinn indicates that Men in particular who are managing moral injury syndrome are twice as likely to be thinking about or attempting suicide as their peers who do not have moral injury syndrome. Individuals who are managing moral injury syndrome have reduced mental health resilience in that they have more difficulty responding to psychotherapy than those who are not managing moral injury syndrome. There's research showing that all other things being equal, individuals who are managing moral injury or spiritual distress can still be in mental health treatment decades longer than their peers who did not have that kind of distress. And finally, because there is a disorder of trust, individuals managing moral injury syndrome lose social support. They step away from relationships. So 
they limit their relationship with families. They step away from community of faith. They step away from values-based activities such as volunteer work and hobbies. Eventually, if moral injury wins all of the decisions for the day, they wind up in the basement with a six pack of beer and a video game, both attempts at anesthesia for the distress that they are feeling. To maintain our veterans' mental health and safety, we really need to look seriously at expanding treatment for moral injury, using evidence-based treatments for moral injury and getting them implemented in ways that veterans feel comfortable accessing them. The circumstances, this is going from the therapy office to theory, circumstances that can precipitate moral injury include doing something that we feel violates our own moral code, witnessing something that may violate our moral code or values, feeling helpless to address a harmful situation or being betrayed by authorities or peers. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the psycho-spiritual developmental theory. This is one of two theories of how moral injury develops, how moral injury develops. So according to the psycho-spiritual developmental theory, full disclosure, my theory, I'm a biased presenter on that, Everybody at some point in their life experiences multiple moral contexts. We grow up with a set of rules and values in our civic life. If we are a member of a community of faith, there may be another set of rules and values that by and large overlap, but there may be some differences. Um, as psychologists, we get another set of rules and laws in our ethics code, for example. Sometimes these may come into conflict with one another. I've talked with lots of people who've never been deployed, but they had differences between their faith groups' beliefs about divorce and the rules and laws in their civic life about divorce. I've seen many psychologists in the VA system, for example, when there were rules made about how we teach about diversity or how or if we talk about abortion, feel that they were in a conflict between what the ethics code tells them and what the VA is telling them to do. So anybody can find themselves in a situation where there are competing moral contexts that don't agree with each other. When one of those moral contexts is the rules of engagement, there are many more opportunities for the moral context when it is, one is in to conflict with the moral context that one has been in in the past, putting somebody in an inescapable moral dilemma. I have one set of rules that says to do this. I have another set of rules that says to do the opposite. So let's take a look developmentally about how our veterans are prepared when they are deployed to deal with these kinds of differences in moral context. Most adults in the U.S. spend most of their life at the synthetic conventional level of psycho-spiritual development, which means I have learned all the rules and I have learned who all the authorities are. If I do what the rules tell me to do, I am good and right. If I'm confused about what the rules tell me to do, I go to the authorities. If I do what the authorities tell me to do, I am good and right. When one is in combat, however, there are a lot of decisions that need to be made in which there is not one incontrovertible good and right. We see a child in a puffy vest with wires sticking out of it approaching the checkpoint. We hold up our hand to tell them to stop. We shout stop in all the area languages. We shoot over their heads as a warning shot. The child keeps coming. If they keep coming, they could kill a hundred people at the checkpoint. There is not a good, bad, right, wrong in this situation. There is the best I could do with the resources and training I had in the situation I was in. To be able to break out of good, bad categories and be able to start to think of this on a better, worse continuum, the individual needs to at least approach stage four. They need to be able to critically evaluate their previously held religious ideas. 
they need to be able to look at multiple perspectives to consider the, for example, for those in religious communities to start looking at the context of scripture and ask questions about why we interpret it that way. Um, these are not convenient members of the congregation. They're not convenient members of a um, military unit. It's very important to act fast in the military. We don't have time to sit around and talk about all of these different perspective ideas. The child is coming. If you don't fire in the next three seconds, a lot of people are going to die. So let's take a look at what that means developmentally for our veterans. Most of our veterans are deployed between ages of 18 and 25. Our brains are not fully mature and many times they're not able to do what they would need to do to function at Fowler 4 until we are in our early to mid 30s. So our choices as a young adult in deployment to either look at our assumptions about the world, our black, white, yes, no, good, bad assumptions, which rapidly collapse and the house falls in on the pit below them. That's what happens if they stay at Fowler 3. If we can help them make an approach to Fowler 4, there is a way to rebuild the house with a more complex foundation that's going to hold up to more shaking. I wanna be extremely clear, this is not talking about being theologically liberal or conservative. This is not how we, this has to do with how we make moral decisions. It's a process variable. Do we completely defer to authorities without question? Or do we consider the multiple context long enough to ask a lot of questions and consider multiple perspectives? That's the skill that is the way out of the hole when we are treating moral injury. Another developmental piece of treating moral injury is when we are working with a 70, 80 year old Vietnam vet who is talking about what he or she did when they were 18, 19, 20 years old. Often they are judging that young adult based on the resources and wisdom accrued by that 70 or 80 year old. It's very important to confront that older veteran with the fact that it, that's not a fair way to judge themselves when they were 18, 19, 20 years old. They did not have the same resources at that time. I've talked a little bit about the internalizing and externalizing presentations. Those who are inter internalizers are using self-blame for terror management a large percentage of the time. They are trading, for example, they're usually trading a sense of control for terror. So it feels horrible to blame oneself, but to think of, as, think of yourself as having absolutely no control over the situation can be so terrifying that it's disabling. And in combat, one can't afford to be disabling, disabled. So they use self-blame. It was my fault. If it was my fault, I had some control. For those who have the externalizing presentation, they still live with the terrifying, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but the thing that they can hang on to is, and it's not my fault. So they are both terror management strategies. They're just different terror management strategies. So there are some landmines that we often trip over when we're trying to help veterans who are managing moral injury syndrome. And I do a lot of consulting for counselors and therapists who feel that they're running on a hamster wheel because the veteran keeps going from an understanding, okay, so what I did was the only thing I could do and by the standard, it was right. And then they come back next session and said, but it was wrong for me to do that. That's because they can only think about one moral context at a time. They might go rapidly back and forth between them, but they can't bring both moral contexts into their reasoning at the same time. They're still functioning at Fowler Free. One thing to be very aware of is often veterans come back to us again and again and again, talking about the same inappropriate guilt. This inappropriate guilt is a risk factor for suicide. If every time they come back to us talking about it, we wrap our arms around them and provide them all kinds of warm, fuzzy support and resources, we are teaching them to express and experience more and more inappropriate guilt. 
the first time somebody comes to me with guilt, unless they tell me they've repeatedly gone to many other people about this, I will assume it's real guilt and I will use the standard cognitive strategies that we use to help people diffuse guilt. After that, I don't get warm and fuzzy and I spend, I take a much more analytical approach. So the way this conversation usually goes is I will ask the veteran, so when did this guilt bomb first go off? This guilt that is dominating your life now started at some point. When was that? Oh, yes, that happened in my first firefight in Vietnam. What was going on in that firefight? My best friend and I joined the Marines on the buddy system. We were right next to each other on the line. He was shot and killed. I wasn't. How did you feel right before the guilt started? Somebody just like me bought it. If my best friend could be killed, I could be killed. I was absolutely terrified. I lost track of like where the enemy was and where I was supposed to be firing. I forgot where I was keeping my ammo. I couldn't function. How did you feel after the guilt started? Well, truth be told, I felt like hell, but I figured out that my best friend died because I didn't use my combat skills well enough. And that meant that if I used my combat skills to the best of my ability every time they were needed, I could keep myself and other people from dying. So now when we have this talk with the veteran, it becomes clearer to them how the guilt became a coping strategy for them. When I have this conversation, I often joke with veterans that they are hugging a teddy bear that is stuffed with razor wire. It helped them to function in combat when they needed to figure out how to function. If they keep hugging that thing now, they will bleed to death. It needs to be a coping strategy that they let go or find a substitute for. Um, and that's when we start building spiritual strength. Externalizers do this a little differently. They do terror management through anger. Most of our externalizers will present as distrustful of authority, um, fearful of authority. If somebody in a position of authority, which sadly anybody who is a counselor is, whether they like it or not, if an authority tells them to do something because authorities are scary and don't care about them, it literally takes that option off the table for them. So it's extremely important to use patient-centered interventions. You don't have to come to this building spiritual strength group. You're the expert in what you need. If you think it'll be helpful, you're welcome to come. If you don't think it's going to help you, then let's look for something else that you think will help you. With our externalizers, I use a lot of paradoxical interventions. I will often throw down the gauntlet. I don't think you're ready to do this. I don't think you should try it unless you're absolutely sure you can do it. You know, buddy, I really appreciate it that you disagree with everything I say in group. I can't do my best job unless I know where you stand with me. So thank you. Please keep doing that. As soon as the authority tells them that this is what is wanted, because they are so gut level oppositional, they will do the opposite of that. This is a skill that I developed as a junior high choral teacher for 10 years. Um, but this is a skill that you definitely need when working with people who have externalizing moral injury. So I'm going to move a little bit from moral injury, how it develops, what it is and how it presents to why we would use building spiritual strength or any other type of spiritually integrated care to treat moral injury. Well, you know, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy are extremely effective treatments for PTSD. I often joke around that they are the colonoscopy of mental health because they work they save lives, they are worth doing, and most of our veterans won't do them. One of the things I became aware of early on in my tenure with VA is that many of my veterans were much more interested in speaking to chaplains than anybody whose first name was doctor. So it occurred to me that I could partner with chaplains 
and find a way to make treatment socially acceptable and accessible to veterans who had no interest or found conventional mental health services too stigmatizing to enter. There is more and more research tying this kind of spiritual distress that building spiritual strength uses as a mechanism of action to PTSD. We know that those who have more spiritual distress have more suicidal ideation, make more attempts. Um, people who have spiritual distress have more severe PTSD symptoms and have a longer course of symptoms. So it is really an important piece of our practice to address the spiritual components of PTSD, which often has a lot of existential implications. We have done two randomized controlled trials of building spiritual strength. In the pilot study, we randomized veterans to either building spiritual strength or a waitlist control group. Those in building spiritual strength over eight weeks demonstrated improved PTSD and depression symptoms, as well as in increased positive religious coping. When we then took the folks in the waiting list and put them into building spiritual strength, we saw exactly the same pattern of improvements as compared to their baseline. There was an important data trend in this study that showed that building spiritual strength was more effective for minority veterans, specifically our African-American and Latinx veterans than it was for Caucasians, which is a rare event in psychotherapy development. So I am hoping that building spiritual strength can become a tool to help us address mental health disparities. In our second study, we had much more funding. This was a full randomized clinical trial. So we could do a more rigorous study comparing building spiritual strength to present-centered group therapy, a standard evidence-based treatment for PTSD. We were able to measure more rings at that point. This was in 2013 was when we started this study. Um, there still were not measures that could tell us about changes in symptoms of moral injury syndrome, but there were new measures that could help to measure spiritual distress that were a decided advantage over the previous positive spiritual coping instrument that we had. The other thing we did with the second study is our study therapists were all chaplains because we wanted to learn if chaplains could implement this intervention with fidelity as well as mental health providers. Um, the therapists were all nested. That means they, for, they worked with equally with both conditions to control for therapist effects. We had manuals for both conditions. We tested, we listened to 20% of the sessions and rated them on a fidelity monitoring instrument in both conditions. Uh, we used both the clinician administered PTSD scale, pre and post, and the PTSD checklist. We included the PTSD checklist simply because we didn't have enough funds to do the cl clinician administered PTSD scale at long-term follow-up and we could mail folks a PTSD checklist. The religious and spiritual struggle scale was our allegory for moral injury. Um, and then this is our consort chart from how recruitment went. The data was collected in Minnesota and by and large, the population was pretty typical of the area in which we were recruiting. Although I will say that the range of religious beliefs in the sample was much more diverse than we were expecting. One thing that was exciting about that is clearly this is an intervention designed to be used in the federal setting. It's critically important that the intervention doesn't make it seem as though being religious is better than being non-religious. And it's very important that the intervention doesn't prefer any one faith perspective to any other faith perspective. And our qualitative data afterwards, we asked all of our participants if they felt that their faith perspective was accepted and 
you know, respected throughout the intervention that no one had any concerns that their faith identification was not respected. The results that we got, and these results are actually quite typical of all studies that use both the CAPS and the PTSD checklist. We had from the beginning of group to the end of group, roughly the same amount of reduction in PTSD symptoms from beginning to end in both present-centered group therapy and building spiritual strength. Um, those of you who do research using both of these instruments will immediately be understand why we have a little bit of a difference with the PTSD checklist. There doesn't appear to be as much reduction with the PTSD checklist and there appears to be a rebound. That is because in every study both of these instruments have been used in, it's become clear that the clinician administered PTSD scale is much more sensitive to decreases in symptoms than the PTSD checklist. For example, if I ask a veteran, do you find yourself worried for your safety even in situations where that might not be warranted? The veteran will tell me, oh yes, every day before I can go to sleep, I've got to lock all the doors and windows in the house. How much of your time does that take? Oh, about five minutes. Does that interfere with any of your regular family activities or anything that you usually want to get done? No, it's not a problem. I just make sure I do it. On the clinician administered PTSD scale, that does not get checked as a symptom. That's normal range behavior that the veteran is interpreting as a symptom of PTSD. On the PTSD checklist, that veteran says, why, yes, I have this. This is a symptom. I have it every day. I, it's very serious for me. So it gets checked off as at the top of the scale for severity. So that's why these graphs look a little bit different. But bottom line, statistically, building spiritual strength wasn't different from what we get from present-centered group therapy in terms of reduction of PTSD symptoms. In terms of our measures of spiritual distress, the real take home message is in this top left hand box marked divine. So this is the divine distress scale. It measures distress in one's relationship with a higher power. It is the subscale of the religious and spiritual struggle scale that accounts for more variance in the total measure than any other subscale does. And I'll talk a little bit more about that measure and why I'm really pleased that we got differences in this particular subscale. So the red line is the building spiritual strength group. And you can see from the beginning of the intervention to the end of the intervention, there was a marked decrease in their distress in their relationship with whatever higher power or ultimate value they identify. From the end of the intervention to two month follow up, that reduction in distress was continuing. They had learned tools that they were able to use to continue to manage and decrease that distress on their own. On the other hand, for the present centered group therapy, there was a bit of an increase in spiritual distress between the beginning of their participation in the study and the end of the intervention. And at two month follow up, there was in fact an accelerating rate of increased spiritual distress. Now this raises a question and we don't have the answer to it yet. We need to do some more research, but is it possible that in this and some of our other evidence-based treatments for PTSD, well, we may be substantially reducing PTSD symptoms and we could see from the previous slide in both conditions, we were making tremendous headway in reducing PTSD symptoms. But might some of these interventions be increasing spiritual distress without intending to in the course of treatment? We don't know that, but this result suggests that this is a question we need to start asking. So here are the items on the divine distress scale. The divine distress scale subsumes 38% of the variance that is measured on the religious and spiritual struggle scale. It has an eigenvalue of 10. The next highest subscale for explaining variance has an eigenvalue of only three. It is an extremely internally consistent scale. 
And the divine distress scale has a lot of important relationships with mental health. In fact, the correlations between this subscale and mental health outcomes are stronger than for any other subscale on the religious and spiritual struggle scale. Divine distress is strongly correlated with depression, anxiety, anger, and loneliness. And at the same time, it is negatively correlated with the presence of meaning in life and life satisfaction. So you can see in these symptoms some of the outline of what we see as these symptoms of moral injury syndrome. So the conclusions from this research that we can draw is BSS and present-centered group therapy, you know, we haven't done a non-inferiority trial, but what we can see is they're very similar in terms of their ability to reduce PTSD symptoms. But building spiritual strength is much more effective, large effect size more effective than present-centered group therapy in reducing spiritual distress. Um, to our knowledge, this is to date the only clinical trial with treatment for moral injury or spiritual distress that actually uses spiritual distress as an outcome. And the fact that this psychospiritual developmental mechanism was so successful, successful in addressing both PTSD and spiritual distress symptoms suggest that we do need to do more research in that area. If you need references, these are the ones that were specifically referred to in this presentation. I can get you more. If you want to learn more, this website will take you to a page that will give you all the information that is out there and available on building spiritual strength. It is available both in the VA intranet and outside the VA intranet. It will get you the intervention manuals. It will give you all of the research supporting the development and the theory behind building spiritual strength. It will get you therapist training materials, including some videos of techniques that we use. I ask that if somebody wants to start using the building spiritual strength intervention, that they get in touch with me. I offer a free online full day training to new building spiritual strength facilitators to help them learn how to use the intervention correctly and safely. This is my email address, and this is my telephone number at VA Maine. If you're needing to reach me, there is a way to reach me through this website. The email works very well. Um, if I am presenting or working with clients, obviously the phone isn't a great way to reach me, so I recommend that you try to reach me over email first. If you ever get extra time and you want to see a video part of a role-played BSS session, this website can take you there. So with that, I am going to take my PowerPoint off the screen and we can take some time. Oh, thank you so much for putting those in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, if people have questions, want to ask about something, want to comment about something, if you're horrified by something I said, please bring that up. I want to hear about it. So Irene, that was amazing. There are surprisingly, I think just it, there were so many nuggets. It was so full of um, just fantastic information. People were probably jotting down notes, but there um, are currently no questions posted in the Q&A box or in the chat. I'm scrolling. Uh, not seeing. Thank you, Tracy. Oh, okay. We do have a question now from Paul. Wondering if you're thinking about doing heart rate variability in your future studies. Oh, that is such a good question. And yes, that's, that is on my list. I have recently started collaborating with Jeff Pine at the Little Rock VA. And moral injury and heart rate variability are both things that he has done a lot of work with. Um, so yeah, that's a future direction I'd really like to go. 
And I see that there's something else in the chat and I just had an email come up in front of it that I can't get rid of. Okay, that's all right. We've got a couple more questions in the q and I think we're on a roll now. Oksana says, did you say we can see the manual on the marketplace? Yes, you can. Website? Okay, and, and if you can repeat the information on training. Okay, so on training, um, if you can either email me or go to the BSS website and you can send an email to the BSS leadership uh, website. Um, I'm sorry, through the website, you can share an email with the BSS leadership team, which means it'll come to me and I will either arrange for training for you or I will get somebody else on the leadership team to set up training. Um, Great, thanks. One more um, from Susan. In doing evaluations with veterans seeking disability support, I often see veterans I think that would benefit. Can I mention this type of therapy to them as something they might seek? So yes, you can. You know, BSS is not available in every VA, so don't tell them that it is certainly available. Right now across the country, I've recently done a little survey of this only about 75 of the VA's over a thousand facilities are providing some sort of evidence-based intervention for moral injury. But it is appropriate to say that if you are dealing with some significant values conflict related to trauma, that it is perfectly fine to talk with your providers about getting some specialized care that is not just PTSD care. It's um, I see the question about why I use G hyphen D. Mm -hmm. And that is because there are religious groups that find it offensive to have the name of God written out. So to make the, the intervention something, the presentation something that anybody can use without being offended, I, I adhere to that, that convention. Okay, wonderful. So you, are, I think you're, are, you can see the Q&A chat. Yes, I'm able yeah. to see Okay, that. We have so, a chaplain, Michael. So the credentials of the chaplains in the second study, one of them was an LMFT. Another one had a master's degree in psychology. And another one had a bachelor's level of training in marriage and family counseling. And Alejandro okay, is asking about it, a moral injury being almost exclusively military. Other chaplain associations, including non-VA, non-military, are starting to discuss this. Is the moral injury construct allowing sort of expansion beyond uh, veterans and active duty soldiers? So this is a really good question, and there is some controversy in the field, and there is now one side winning out on that controversy. Originally, um, people who were moral injury theorists, treatment professionals, researchers, the, the vast majority believed that moral injury was a primarily veteran, military, maybe first responder, police, firefighters experience. Um, with the COVID pandemic, we have now learned that 25 to 30 percent, for example, of our healthcare workforce are describing symptoms of moral injury syndrome, and an even higher percentage of educators are describing symptoms of moral injury syndrome. So the conventional wisdom at this point is becoming more and more that there is, there are definitely more than one way to experience a potentially morally injurious event. And we are starting to adapt treatment, particularly for healthcare providers, et cetera, so that we can expand the reach of this kind of work. Awesome. Okay. So Dr. Meyer, I excellent question. I would love to be able to compare building spiritual strength to adaptive disclosure impact of killing in war, trauma-informed guilt reduction, and the self-forgiveness workbook, which are the other four evidence-based interventions for moral injury. The problem with that is of those five interventions, 
building spiritual strength is the only one that is group. And there are not really good research methods to do a head-to-head -head comparison of an individual and a group intervention. So yeah, good question, but I don't have the technology to do that at this point. Pete is asking about working mm -hmm. with veterans who don't identify with having a spiritual connection, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. feel that their traumas are related to um, moral integrity. If you could Absolutely. talk a little bit about that. I work with these veterans all the time um, in building spiritual strength. And I've had an unusual number of agnostic and atheist veterans come into the building spiritual strength protocol. Nobody's twisting their arm at making them. We use the term ultimate value rather than higher power for those folks. And we talk about the differences between their ultimate value, their values, integrity, et cetera, between what they've done, what they would have liked to have done, et cetera. So we substitute values for the spiritual components and we have been getting good results with these veterans. And these veterans by and large tell us that they've, they have felt that this was helpful, even though they didn't think of their concerns in spiritual terms. I know there's a bunch of things in the chat. There are some here. in the chat. Um, and just folks I know are gonna need to transition to their next meeting. So I did post the continuing education information, including the link to the SurveyMonkey um, survey that you all um, must complete if you want continuing education. You will be getting an email to the email address that you registered with after today's session. So if you need to drop off, go right ahead. And Irene, I keep, every time somebody adds something, it's hard to go back up. Um, Dr. Meyer asks specifically about comparing spiritual strength as an outcome to moral injury using the MIES or MIQ. Maybe right. You know what those uh, <laughs> instruments I know them are? Both you can... okay. Very okay. well. The MIES measures primarily exposure to potentially morally injurious events and will not detect change in symptoms. The MIQ is will get something about change, but it, it, it measures in one, one construct, both exposure and symptoms. So that is a methodological problem. So for the next study I'm doing, I'm planning on using Gretlitz's moral injury outcome scale, which takes these things apart more effectively. It is a newer scale. Um, another scale that I've used that I've felt better about has been the expressions of moral injury scale, which is, again, not a perfect instrument, but it's one of the better ones that we have had to date. Somebody asked how important it was that the group leader be a spiritual person. And I will tell you, I've been doing a lot of training BSS providers. I've trained, I'm sure, like 150 BSS providers. Many of them have been people who didn't have a particular spiritual outlook. What those folks did was they usually paired with a chaplain so that there were two leaders and they did just fine. Um, I, the last training I did, somebody asked me, hey, how can I respond from the perspective of a higher power if I don't have a higher power in my life? And I said, well, respond from the perspective of your ultimate value. And she said, great, I'm an act therapist. I know exactly what to do with that. Any other questions I didn't get to? You're getting a lot of kudos. I think some folks realized that we were working through the Q&A box. Yeah, and, and put their questions there. There. Um, there was a question about the recording of the webinar. I just put the link in the chat for the VA section webinar series. And yes, this fabulous and amazing webinar uh, will be on our website along with Dr. Harris's slides by the end of the week. Give us a little while, but we have to 
uh, the recording has to do its fancy thing in the cloud and we have to pull it down and it has to go through APA approval, but it will be there hopefully by the end of next week. All right, Dr. Harris, you're continuing to get kudos in the chat. This was an amazing, amazing presentation. You. you just broke things down in a way that was so clear. The clinical examples were just uh, so very helpful. Really appreciate also your approach to research and you know sharing that you know some tools and, and measures are are not perfect, but that's we're going to still plow ahead because that's what we need to do to help people. So so much appreciate you um, coming and presenting today. Appreciate all of the attendees for taking time out of their busy schedules to spend the morning or afternoon with us and really, really appreciate everything everybody is doing right now to just build strength for sure um, in everybody that uh, we meet and greet throughout our days, either clinically or just in general. I think the world needs some positivity. So thank you all so much for coming today and we will see you next month. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And, uh, all right. Let's save the